The story or stories you are about to hear are to entertain. The writers of these stories may claim they are true, yet they may not be. That is up to you to decide. After all, this world is a strange one. If you have a scary experience, send it to me at darkstories.org to have it narrated. And let me know in the comments if you prefer a short intro like this, the usual, or none at all. Let's begin. Hill 29 from The Woodsman. Talk to anyone around my age about camping when they were young, and they'll tell you all about their proverbial good old days. I suppose I'm no different, really. We used to go and get plastered in every grove and gully from here to Florida. Not like we had much else to do. School was a joke. We were young and stupid. We didn't have a care in the world. Funny enough, you go camping as much as we used to, and it becomes less like camping, and more like just kind of hanging out. I mean, really, every summer, every weekend, all the time we had to spare. You could expect us to be in some backwoods hollow raising heck. So as you can imagine, most of the memories of those days I got are just kind of one big blob, but not this one. Out here, federal land means to us free roam. Never really knew why the feds latched themselves onto so much nothingness, but they did, and it created for us our very own little slice of the wild. Rarely did we see or even hear anyone else out there. The only other human beings out there within 50 miles were the army squads that used the woods as training grounds pretty regularly. They had a whole grid and label system set up out there, and thanks to a kid named Tommy's dad, We'd gotten our hands on one of the maps. We navigated with the grids, markers, and numbered features, and all kinds of other minute, individually specified details. Even now, people refer to my hometown area as hill country. High sandstone cliffs with winding, dusty paths stretching far into the sky, as well as low, dark valleys where the air felt good as conditioned. The lands bordered on a big military base, so generally speaking, the town was an army town. Of the small group of guys we had that went out, all but one was a military kid. Now, I'm not saying that army families always have trouble in them, but it'd be ignorant for me to not say that they did more often than not, so getting out of the house was sometimes a priority. And so, we'd load two or three old pickup trucks with our green army bags and put on our green army coats, heading into the endless green valleys and ridges. Not long ago, parks and the like weren't really maintained as well as they are now, and federal lands had basically no management in comparison. Dirt roads and dilapidated fences made up the border of the nearly untouched open expanse. There were hardly even trails, and half of them were cut by us. Cell phones weren't really a thing we had, so to keep in contact, we used radios. A friend of mine, Mika, was a real whiz with that kind of thing. I was never really considered the brightest of kids, especially when it came to electronics, so I had rather basic understanding of how the radios worked. What I did know was that the hilly terrain messed with them, so when we had two separate groups, we'd have to set up a small relay tower and then take it down at the end of the trip. Nothing major, just a small little tripod thing in a little black box propped atop one of the many numbered hills. This particular trip happened late summer. Our senior year of high school was to start up soon, so we had a pretty sizable group. It was me, Tommy, Mika, Porter, Herschel, and another group of six who'd be across a cliffside from us, some of Herschel's friend, a guy named JT, and some other kids we sort of knew. We were all set for a week-long, beer-fueled send-off to the summer of 86. Stupid, yeah. Fun, also yeah. Anywho, we loaded up the same old way, a couple of beater cars headed up and down the winding valley roads, 
pushing about eight o'clock, we pulled off onto some back road, bounced up and down along the old dirt path for a few miles, and eventually parked in a little clearing. The two groups split themselves and unpacked their bags from the trucks, reviewed our plans, and got ready to roll out. Herschel, Porter, and Tommy would head off on the south side of Hill Number 29, along the 38003 line, and the other group would work their way along the close side of Hill Number 28, ending up somewhere along the 36-001 area. It became mine and Mika's job to work our way up 29 and set up a communication tower, so the two groups could keep in contact. Everyone set off like a little pack of GIs, eventually diverging our separate ways. Mika and myself, with pieces and parts lashed to our pack frames, began the ascent to the sandy reaches of 29, as the rest of the guys headed deeper into the rapidly darkening woods. We made up our minds to be swift about the task, as it would be pitch black within the hour, and our flashlights weren't exactly the brightest. The climb was rough in patches, with rather sheer rock slides that were only made navigable by the protruding roots that served as our natural handholds. We made it to the peak area as the sun was setting, and worked out a setup for the tower. Soon it was erected and ready for relay. Hey Jake, think we'll pick anything up? Mika had a set of headphones plugged into the box, rotating a dial. Dunno, probably not. How strong is it? I replied. Oh, if we heard anything, it'd be army in the area. Say for that, I'd be surprised if anything were close enough. Mika answered, while digging into the OD green carrying case. He produced another set of headphones from somewhere within the plastic box and gestured for me to take them. I slide them down over my ears and listen in. I can faintly hear Mika's, hmm, as the static flickered back and forth over the radio. Little but faint murmurs came through, and static to fill the gaps. Mika sat back, looked at the device again, and switched to dial over. A sudden new patch of static filled my ears, as Mika began to carefully rotate the knob. For a minute, I thought we'd hear nothing, when the radio picked up the faintest of signals. I could only pick up small phrases between the static. We'll go right side. Over the south, back on the... Faint ramblings faded in and out of our hearing. Target 0079 is within... 03, moving west at... Roger, stay vigilant. The channel then reverted back to static, and we could no longer hear anything. I wonder what that was about, Mika pondered, removing the headphones. Probably some army drill or something, I replied placing my own headphones back into the case. The sun was getting really low. Well, we ought to be getting down to camp. At this rate, we'll be getting there by dark. If they don't have the fire set up by now, I'll strangle one of them. He trailed off as he packed his things. We began back down the steep trail towards the turn and headed for camp. It was dark, as Mika predicted, when we finally trudged into camp. Two rather basic wooden sheds we'd built some time back stood illuminated by a fire contained in an old metal fire ring. We ate a hasty meal of canned garbage, radioed the camp across the hill to check the comms, then fell asleep. I woke up maybe half an hour before the crack of dawn and did what all campers do upon awakening. I walked what felt to be a suitable distance from the campsite and took care of business, then decided to head down to a nearby stream. As the first pastel lights of morning cut their way through the sky, I washed my face and took a drink. I plunged my arms into the cold water, and as I did so, a crack and a screech faintly bounced across the valley. Perplexed, I stood up and strained my ears for more, but it never came. This was a strange occurrence, sure, but I'd certainly encountered stranger. Besides, I was pretty sure I knew what this one was. If you've never heard a cougar scream, well, I'll say that I can understand why the old settlers told stories of monsters in the hills. I made my way back to camp, 
and began to throw some more logs under the fire. Soon the crackling of flames eating away at dry logs awoke the guys. Within a few minutes, the camp was full of life. Herschel and Tommy were frying up some bacon over the fire. Mika and Porter collected wood, and I busied myself cleaning one of the two hunting rifles we brought. The rifle itself was Porter's, or rather, his dad's. A rugged old bolt action chambered in 308 with a short, nondescript scope set atop. The other rifle, Tommy's, was a touch newer, a sleek, slender 22 made for small things, squirrels and the like. For today, we'd planned a short hunt, as it may just be the only full day when we weren't drunk or hungover. After sitting down to eat our breakfast and some messing around with each other, we loaded up our packs, then set off with either rifle or binoculars in hand. Porter and I would set off on the mid-elevation areas in search of deer or anything else substantial, and Tommy, Mika, and Herschel would go about bagging some squirrel or rabbit. Neither of those animals were in season, but that wasn't something that was enforced, nor that anyone really cared too much about for that matter. Each group took a radio and took off. As we trudged into the woods, light flecks of rain began to mist across our shirts and soon warranted a deployment of our army ponchos. The cliff trails were soon slick with mud as our leather boots left tracks behind us, Every now and again, we would stop at an overlook, scan with scope and binoculars, and see what we could find. We saw some light movement on the other side of the valley, and very little aside from that. We walked on into the afternoon in the misty rain, stopping to have some lunch of canned sausages and sandwiches. Soon we were on the move again. The rain began to fall with more force, now at a full rainstorm pace. On one of our stops to search the valley, Porter picked up more movement. There, next to the pine, he said in a subdued breath. Yeah, I got it, I replied, equally as hushed. Buck? Yep, he excitedly whispered. He began to dial in his scope. I heard the click of his safety moving into the offsetting. A shot suddenly cracked through the valley, followed by three more in rapid succession. The deer raised its head, turned for an instant, and took off into the woods. Dang it, exclaimed Porter, lowering the rifle. Ugh, Tommy, why'd we give him the rifle again? He said with a disappointed chuckle. Never was a good shot. Surprised he got more than one in, though, he trailed off. I don't know. Something seems a little weird about that. Let me radio in and... My words were cut short by a burst of noise from the radio in my hand. Porter? Jake? The heck did you find that took four shots to take down? Garbled out of the black box. Porter and I exchanged a brief, wait, what? Look, before I pressed the button and raised the comm to reply. We, we were just about to ask you the same thing. A moment passed with no reply. This rain is real bad. We sh The radio cut out abruptly. Mika? I asked into it. Radio check, do you copy? No response. Well, dang, Porter said aloud. What do you think we should do now? The weather's too bad to stick around. I think they'll think the same and head back to camp, I replied. Probably not a bad idea. Let's get moving, Porter said flicking his safety back on and sliding two caps onto the scope. The sound I heard at dawn rang out from the same vicinity of the shots. Huh, I said, confused. I heard that same sound this morning. Mountain lion? Porter theorized. I guess, I replied. Creepy things, huh. Porter nodded in agreement, but I could tell something didn't sit right with either of us. Nevertheless, we began the trek towards camp, winding down the slick, twisted face of the rocks. Our packs grew heavier and the sun crept lower by the step. We made haste towards the campsite and arrived at around 5 p.m. Porter and I took refuge in one of the old Adirondack shelters around what remained of the morning's campfire. We sat our now damp packs down, 
hung up our rain gear, and changed clothes. We sat down in the back of the shelters and waited for the rest of the folks to arrive. An hour passed by, and both myself and Porter began to get anxious. Our nerves were calmed by the soft sound of footsteps and twigs breaking in the near distance. Porter turned his head. You know, y'all had me a little worried for a second, he called out, standing up and advancing towards the open wall of the shelter. The footsteps stopped abruptly, and so did Porter. Silence fell on the campsite. Tommy, you guys good? He cautiously said into the dark droves of trees. The weighty footsteps burst off, scampering in the opposite direction. Porter hardly breathed a, what the hell? Before another set of footsteps from behind him made him whip around, facing the oncoming steps. It was Herschel, Mika, and Tommy. What's going on? You good? Herschel questioned to a disoriented Porter. Y yeah, he stammered out with somewhat of a relieved sigh. We all settled down into our shelters as the rain pelted the roofs. For a while, a silence hung about the camp. No one wanted to address the strangeness of the events that day, and I knew the other guys were just as suspicious as me and Porter. Mika broke the silence. I think we should radio the other group, he declared, standing up. We need to get the comms working again to make sure they're okay. From what I can tell, I think the storm may have knocked out the tower. I'm not sure, though. I don't remember JT or any of them saying if they had rifles or not. Maybe they did. Maybe that's what we heard, but we still need to check. We nodded and grumbled in agreement. The plan was that Mika, Herschel, and myself would work our way back to the station atop 29, figuring out what was wrong with the relay, then contact the other group. Porter and Tommy would stay at the campsite, waiting for contact from us. With our bags packed and ready to move the next morning, we skipped dinner and laid down for the night. The sounds of the rain pouring against the shelters put us to sleep. I rose at first light, which was shrouded in the grim clouds that still bore rain. With some difficulty, I was awakened by Porter, who was up before anyone else. The rest of the group followed. You think this bloody rain will ever stop? Groaned Tommy, cracking open a can of beans. He placed four more cans into the struggling fire lids open and gave each a stir. All of us got dressed and laced our boots, checking on our bags and getting ready to set out. We joked around a bit while digging our spoons into the burnt cans, eating a quick meal. I'm honestly not too sure what happened to the relay, Mika said between bites. It's never done anything like this before. It should have been able to make it through a storm ten times this fierce. We all exchanged somewhat uneasy glances. For the first time, we collectively acknowledged the strangeness of the trip's occurrences. The moment passed, and we prepared for our trek. I slung my backpack on, donned my poncho, and watched my two companions do the same. Porter and Tommy began to find something to keep themselves, collecting and splitting wood, cleaning a rifle, and things like that. Mika and Herschel began to move towards the trails, and I followed. We soon found ourselves amongst the endless, pointless ups and downs that inhabited these woods. The soft pats of rubber-soled boots became our soundtrack as we moved about the forest. After a while, the rain let up, and we became bored of the sounds around us. We started to talk. I thought this trip would be a little less, I don't know, weird? Herschel said, echoing our thoughts. Me too, I replied. I hate being on edge out here. I think we're thinking too much, Mika sighed. Let's forget about all this creepy garbage and drink some beer or something. Truer words were not spoken the rest of the trek. Eventually, we reached the base of the hill. The sky grew dark again as we neared our route. The slick limestone faces above peered down at us, as a bear might to a mouse. 
Plant life grew all down the sides and along the length of the ridge's spine. Great boulders and minuscule pebbles stood alongside each other, perched high above the dark recesses of the grounds beneath. With a grunt aloud, Herschel was the first to start the steep ascent. The climb of sorts followed a series of crags and faces as it worked its way up. Parts of the hill were little more than inclined hiking. Others were more akin to rock climbing. I certainly felt my pack the whole time as it gave the slightest of pulls on my back, away from the hill itself. We made good time of the hill, and soon we found ourselves rapidly nearing the peak. Each of us found ourselves a small seat atop the hill, taking a drink of water and breathing hard. The sun was just past its midpoint, and the view across the valley was unparalleled. A hush crept amongst us. We all felt a stark tranquility. The overlook gave us a look into all that was the valley, with its tall, dense green shadows and looming hills as far as we could see. For a moment, we were all at peace. The passing quiet was shattered by sounds I'll never forget. First a thud in the near distance, then another shot, followed by screams. I've heard people in pain cry out before, but this... this was like nothing else. Pure, primal shrieks of absolute pain and terror. I could feel the fear in my ears as the screams ripped across the valley in front of us, echoing off the distant hills. My stomach dropped, like I was a rider on a million roller coasters. I felt sick to the core. I saw Herschel and Mika react the same way. Mika looked like he might vomit, too. With huge eyes, he spoke. What? The Mother of God? Was that? He staggered out, mirroring all of our reactions of confusion and fear. I don't know, Herschel said. From the looks of it, he was ready to bolt. Call Porter. Figure out what that was. Right, Mika said curtly, as he frantically dug for his radio. Porter, Tommy, did you hear that? No response. Guys, not funny. Did you hear that? Mika was beginning to panic. Silence. Did you hear that? Mika screamed into the radio, nearly in a rage. He cursed and shoved the radio into his bag. We need to get up to that tower right now, I said. Herschel nodded, and Mika turned to continue. We scrambled up the rest of the trail, going faster than was probably safe. Soon the small metal tower and box popped into our sight. It stood solitarily amongst the darkening clouds in the sky above it. Mika hurried to it and knelt down beside it. Herschel and I caught our breaths and bent over with our hands on our knees, watching Mika fiddle with the box. His face suddenly went pale. What? What? Herschel asked, to no response from Mika. Mika, I shouted, snapping him out of it. Someone messed with our relay, he said, quietly, still not looking back at us. What? I asked, confused. Someone messed with our relay, Mika shouted. Someone cracked into it and battered the dials and bloody turned it off. Mika was growing angrier by the minute. What the heck? Herschel spat. Who would do that? Who else is even out here? I don't... I don't know. I don't know. Mika dejectedly stated, cooling down. I don't know. Can you fix it? I asked, determined. Yeah, he replied. Give me a minute. Herschel and I looked on as he reset the dials and flipped switches. Suddenly, the radio sprang to life. Sighting was 301-2 north side, looking for a visual on... Roger, we'll go. A stern and regimented voice faded in and out. We all recognized the tone of the man's voice as military. Looking for visual. 0079 is within... would be north side of... Hill number 29. Over. We all went pale. Stay sharp. Move in. Over and out. Did he just say... Herschel trailed off. Yeah, I replied, with a lump in my throat. North side of 29 is 
that's where JT and his guys are, Herschel said, realizing what was happening. Get them on the radio, he said to Mika. The radio. One sec, Mika replied, rapidly moving dials. Get them on the freaking radio, Herschel shouted. I am, I am, give me a bloody second. Mika lashed out, turning dials with more urgency. He whipped out his radio. Hey, JT, whoever has the radio, this is Mika. What the heck was that? An indistinguishable garble flooded the radio. Mika cursed and adjusted more dials. Repeat, he commanded with authority into the microphone. Who is this? Came back through. This is Mika. We're on the other side of the hill from you, Mika said quickly with utmost urgency. Oh, so you're the punks who have been screwing with us, huh? Well, piss off. The radio replied. What? What are you talking about? Mika responded, confused. It's not funny, dude. Screaming and shooting stuff in the woods is just a dirtbag move. That wasn't us, we replied. There was a pause. What do you mean? The radio responded. It wasn't us. We're trying to figure out if you're okay. Mika was growing in anger again. What? I mean, yeah, we're shaken, but no one's hurt. JT said he'd been trying to reach somebody. I guess that was you guys. We've been in this cave JT and some other guys found a bit north. We're gonna hang tight and hopefully this crazy jungle stop happening. Maybe not a bad plan. Stay in contact. The radio should be working now. Sorry about the misunderstanding. It's no big deal. Just stay safe. Mika set the radio down and sighed. We paused for a moment and thought about the events we'd just witnessed. Mika called down to Porter, who said they'd faintly heard the noise and had tried reaching us. He said they'd stay and make contact with the other group to try and set up someone to reliably contact. Well, while we're up here, might as well check the weather, Mika said, finally relaxing a bit. He tuned the radio to the weather frequency. And it looks like we're going to have some nasty rains coming in this evening in the next few days. We have some flooding issues in the Lower Valley region, so if you're in those areas, roads will likely not be safe to travel on. Many local towns have declared a shutdown of most roads in order to... Did they say, here? I asked aloud, realizing what this might mean. That's just great. Now we can't even leave. Herschel exclaimed, hearing the bad news. Yeah, looks like we're stuck here, at least for the night, I sighed. If we're gonna be here, let's at least try to enjoy it, guys, Mika said, standing up. Let's head back to camp. It's been two days out here already, and we haven't even touched our cooler. Let's go get plastered. And that's what we did. By the next morning, we were up far later than was normal all of us sporting head-splitting hangovers from the night before. Herschel groaned as he sat up, setting the precedent for everyone else. We all slogged up slowly and doggedly set about our tasks. We were all doing our best to ignore the prior events and try to enjoy ourselves, at least a little. The ever-present rain made it hard to get a fire going. Fortunately, Porter and Tommy occupied themselves with the acquisition of firewood the day before and had stored nearly half a cord in the shed, using the old mall stored there. The group enjoyed the rather slow and tired breakfast of hotcakes and bacon, a warm refresher from the previous day's breakfast. For a while, it seemed like all was going normal again. It was still raining, not as hard as it was, but nonetheless, so we sat just inside our Adirondack sheds, talking and laughing. We killed maybe three hours doing that. The day passed by uneventfully as dark clouds continuously rolled over our heads. The fire crackled as a meal cooked. Porter moved towards the fire and stirred the pot. A horrible stench wafted up out of it. Jesus, Mika remarked. What'd you do to that thing? I don't know. Maybe I overcooked it, Porter replied, perplexed. Tommy, Herschel, and myself shared the sentiment with Mika. We reluctantly dug out eating equipment and spooned ourselves some of the thick, terrible-smelling stew. We sat back down in our sheds and slowly began to eat, with pinched noses. 
To everyone's surprise, the soup was delicious. We all looked at each other, shrugged, and kept eating. Soon, the cooking pot was empty. We cleaned our bowls and equipment, only to find that the smell persisted. Confused, Herschel spoke out. What is that smell? It's awful, he said in disgust. It's not one of you? Tommy jabbed. No, I don't think so, I said, holding my nose. We tried to play it off, to ignore it, but it was to no avail. A few moments passed as our resolve to continue disregarding the stench that invaded our nostrils faded gradually, and Herschel was the first to crack. Hell with this. What is the friggin' smell? He blurted out. You're right, I can't stand it. We gotta find whatever that is and chuck it off a cliff or something, I replied in utter agreeance. We fanned out and began searching, checking around the site until Porter called out in surprise. Hey, uh, guys, you ought to come look at this. Porter's accented voice faded out as we rushed over to see what he was looking at. His dark eyes were fixated on the ground at the base of a tall oak, just maybe 50 feet down the slope at the back of the campsite. The scattered members of our group slowly and apprehensively made their way to the spot. We strained to peek around the trees, or Porter, whichever obstructed our views. There at the base of the tree lay a jagged lump of puffy white and brown fluff and shiny dark liquids. The tree itself was spattered with the same. It was a deer, misshapen, contorted, sliced, and torn apart. All of us knew from hunting when we were younger that it was relatively fresh. The blood was still bright, the flesh still red and not browned. Bones jutted out from various places within the small pile of creature, cracked like a glow stick. Now bemused, I looked to the others for an explanation, a plan, a concession, anything. I soon found that they matched my expression and that there was no such reasoning to be heard of. Wordless, we turned to make the slow, cautious retreat back into our nearby encampment. I think we could have stayed silent for the rest of the trip, if it were not for what happened next. As we stepped into the edge of our sight, Tommy began to pick up some of his things and moved into the sheds. He returned clutching an axe he'd brought. The rest of us gave but a mere concerned look before inevitably coming to the same conclusion that he'd reached before us. That being, we weren't alone out here. As if a stage cue had been issued, the situation immediately escalated. Behind myself, there was a crack of a stick. Everyone's heads, including mine, snapped backwards to see what had made the faint, nearly inaudible noise at the edge of the tree line. We held our breaths and waited for another noise. Nothing at first, then something. Another stick broke, this time louder opposite from where the last had come from, resonating from behind Herschel, who now had found that he had quickly changed from being the back of the group to being the front. He whipped around just as I, but not before another stick broke, this time two cracks in rapid succession. All of us began to back together, wide-eyed and vigilantly scanning the tree line. I noticed Porter make a slow, methodical shuffle to a shed and returned with the deer rifle. He began to raise it, pointing in the direction of the most recent tracks. I saw Mika do the same with the 22, and suddenly felt naked of defense myself. I drew out my knife, and I held it out, as if it would be a deterrent for whoever was encircling us, to whatever was encircling us. Mika dialed in the rifle, preparing a shot at seemingly nothing. He never got the chance. A shadow, a cloud, a lump of darkness flashed through my vision, blurted out of the trees, and backed in like a dog running a competition. Tommy, nearest the movement, swore and fell backwards, scrambling to get away. In his panic, the axe in his hand slipped, careening into his lower left calf and slicing into him. He cried out in pain, and I rushed to him as Mika and Porter swung around, rifles raised like sentries on a shaft. Tommy was cut bad. The bit of axe had dug about two or three inches into his leg, revealing the dark, reddish matter beneath. 
I made for my bag, retrieved the first aid kit, and fumbled it on the way back to Tommy, who now was wincing repeatedly. I quickly moved to start applying gauze, and Tommy bit down on a stick he had placed in his mouth. Mika and Porter were shouting to each other, but what exactly, I could not tell. I was focused on Tommy, and finishing applying the antiseptic liquids I was pouring onto a rag. I began to cover the wound, when out of the corner of my vision, I saw Porter raise his rifle. A dreadful quiet fell over us, as Porter aimed towards where he last saw the looming dark mass. A moment passed, a mere second that felt like an eternity. The silence was shattered by two deafening booms in rapid succession. Booms that made my ears ring. The dark shadow appeared once more, this time fleeing. The heavy and steady pattering thump of footfalls returned deep into the woods once more, and as they faded away, the whole encampment faded to silence for yet another time. It seemed now that all of these significant events of which we experienced were marked by a silence, a quiet of some kind. We all got up and looked around, as if we hadn't really seen any of it, as if we'd all just imagined everything. But now things were different. It was no longer this sort of unrealized game of cat and mouse. Now we knew what we were into. Now we knew that we weren't just seeing things. Now it was us and them. We all realized this as we set about solemnly patching up Tommy and packing our bags. The rain and the flooding it couldn't have been that bad. We had to get out. We all sat down back at our propped logs near the fire that was now smoldering. We gotta go, Mika said, voicing all of our thoughts. Tommy, Porter, Herschel, and I mumbled in agreement. But we can't try in the dark, Porter said, sounding just as apprehensive as we all felt. We have to. What the hell are we going to do if that thing comes back? Herschel blurted. We shuddered at the first mention of the creature we'd seen since it happened, as if somehow speaking of it gave it life and made it reality. Herschel, you know we can't. You know with all the hills and slopes and crap, we just plain can't make it through in the dark. Porter pressed on. I know. I'm just... Hell, man, we're in a shaky spot right now. And, uh, he trailed off. We knew that Porter was right. We'd have to stay one more night. That didn't stop us from completely mobilizing as the sun set, though. By the time darkness descended upon the site, we'd gathered enough firewood to light up almost 50 feet around us in all directions, and had packs lined up, completely packed, save for our sleeping bags, which lashed onto the outside. We divided up shifts, Porter would start at 9 p.m. and go until midnight, standing watch with a rifle. Porter would wake Mika, who took 12 to 2 a.m., followed by Herschel at 2 to 4, and eventually me, from 4 to sunrise. Tommy needed rest and heal from his leg. The sun was getting low, so we retreated to our shelters, grabbing some additional firewood on the way. Porter examined his rifle, rubbed a mark off the barrel, and chambered around. He sat down onto his upturned log, sighed, and pulled his hat lower. You good to go? Mika inquired. Yeah, I'll wake you up in three, he replied, clearly shaky. Good luck, man. Don't hesitate to get us all up if anything, if you need us. Mika finished after a bit. Yeah, yeah, Porter resolved, tugging at his hat again. The rest of us laid down and waited. According to my watch, Herschel shook me awake at 3.56 a.m. Hey, he said in a deep, hoarse voice. Hey, I replied, just as exhausted. Still plenty of wood. Nobody's seen anything yet, he informed me as I exited my sleeping bag and stood up, pulling on my boots and tucking my arms into a button-up shirt. It was surprisingly chilly. Enjoy the sleep, dude. Wish me luck, I said slapping him on the back as he went for his own bag. Let us know if anything goes wrong. You're up till sunrise, he drowsily stammered, tucking his face into his sleeping bag. I moved to the fire and saw that Herschel had chucked on a few logs before plopping back down next to the fire. 
I resolved to keep a good watch of the stretch of tree line where we'd seen the thing before. Seconds turned into minutes and minutes to hours. The creatures of the dark chirped and howled as the fire crackled. The night grew colder, and I was glad for the flames. Aside from warmth, the blaze allowed me to see around myself. The stars and moon were bright dots painting the sky, lighting up the night, allowing me to see even farther. I could faintly hear the creak at the base of our sight, emitting a distant trickle. A cool, nearly imperceptible breeze flowed through my hair and whisked away sparks and embers of the fire. The tall trees of the valley swayed and danced like ancient deities, engaged in a sleepy waltz. The sky opened itself, as if it were the spotlights upon the theater that was the valley, with curtains of pines and solemn stone faces. My eyes grew heavy as the hands of the great forest gently shut them for me. I awoke from my near catatonic state to what I believed to be pine resin in my fire, cracking louder than usual, as it sometimes does. I put together the thoughts to check my watch, finding it was now nearly 6.30. The sky was beginning to light up. The fire popped loudly again, but something was off. It took me a minute to realize that the fire behind me was not giving off much light anymore, nor was I being warmed. I turned to face it. It was smoldering nearly out. I murmured an expletive and tossed on a few new logs. Soon the fire was going again. I was about to drift off again before my brain finally realized what felt so wrong. How did the fire pop so loudly if it was out? With impeccable timing, another pop rang out. Fully awake, I placed it as a distant noise. It was a gunshot. No, 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 I spoke softly to myself, beginning to realize what was happening. That ear-rending scream I knew all too well boomed through the valley again. My stomach sank. I felt like a kid who was about to be sick on a county fair ride. I stood alone, listening still. Another shorter groan echoed again and snapped me out of it. I turned toward the shed. Guys, hey guys, I yelled panicking. There was stirring in the shelters. Uh, what? What? Mika said, standing up. Listen, I demanded, frantically gesturing to the distance. The four others, now plenty awake, listened intently. There was nothing. They looked at me confused. In the distance, there were shots and screams. I exasperatedly stated, just as Herschel gave a bemused, huh? The screech was back, followed by two more shots. They turned to me wide-eyed. Ah, oh, hell, JT, Herschel said. Radio, get them on the radio. Mika frantically went for his pack. He produced the radio and flicked it on fast. JT, group two, anyone, come in. This is Mika, come in, he shouted. No response. He tried again, but to no avail. Everyone swore. Bags. G get your bags. We gotta go help. I commanded, sounding far more confident in my choice of words than I really was. No one replied, instead heading for their packs and quickly lacing their boots. Porter helped Tommy up, and after talking, I assumed they determined Tommy was well enough to walk. We took off, quickly kicking the fire out as much as we could in about 30 seconds, clicked on our dim lights, and prayed that between that and the slowly rising sun, we would have enough to make our way there. Mika tried over and over to reach group two by radio. We walked into the solemn woods once more, rapidly approaching Hill 29. When we made it to 29, Mika and myself set up the hill for the third time, leaving the rest to wait with Tommy to let him get some time off his bad leg. This time though, we knew our route and got up the hill in no time. To our relief, we didn't hear any more sounds from the other camp. On the flip side, Mika still couldn't reach them, so it wasn't just the radio. We recovered the comms equipment, rapidly strapping it to our pack frames. We scrambled back down and set on the trek again. The forest had transformed so much since our walk in. What was our own green heaven was now a shaded nightmare. 
Our boots were in a strangely uniform cadence as we nearly marched our way up and down the deep hills. The sun was reaching higher and higher in the sky. We clicked our lights off and soon we drew within a few miles of the second encampment. Mika called out loudly. No reply, no surprise there. We descended into the valley down the campsite and soon we could see the large shapes of the shelters in the afternoon sun. We broke the tree line into the camp's clearing and what we saw was bizarre. The site was vacant. We called out again, but it truly was vacant. There were loose belongings here and there, a shirt, a water bottle, and even a pocket knife. The shelters were slightly charred, and the remains of what once was a tent was now a few metal poles and shreds of fabric. A lone, yellowed note, clearly soaked in rain, was left just inside the shelter, under a rock. We tried to make out the words, but what we were able to read was, we had to leave, radio won't, meet back, and something out here. Mika read the mostly unintelligible note. They're already gone, he concluded. God, I hope they made it out, Tommy trailed off. I guess we're on our own now, and we gotta get the heck out of here, Porter said firmly. We turned and began to mobilize. Porter and myself began to help Tommy up, who was sitting on the ground. Hey, shouted a gruff, deep voice, startling us all so badly we nearly dropped Tommy. Mika turned, reaching for his twenty-two and facing whatever it was. As I faced it as well, I was taken aback. A tidy row of about six green-clad troopers stood, each clutching weapons. Several were wearing pack frames with pressurized tanks strapped to them and all kinds of hosing running all over. Others clutched heavy rifles, but all of them were armed to the teeth. They were fanning themselves out and checking around the site like some cheap movie scene. What are you doing here? Demanded one of the soldiers, stepping forward with his rifle thankfully lowered. We are, uh, we, we were camping, I replied. Why'd you bypass all the signs? This place is on lockdown. What signs? Tommy inquired. This land has been off limits for four days now. You shouldn't be here. We've been out here nearly a week, I responded. He sighed. Listen, you shouldn't be here, and you need to go. But we have some questions first. This gave me a bad feeling. Do you know this area well? He inquired. We nodded. Do you know how to get out the fastest? We nodded again. Are you armed? We were confused, but murmured a yes again. This time he nodded, as if to say, good. All right, he said. We're looking for a unit who was sent out on an evasion exercise. I perceived immense mistruth in this excuse. Have you seen anything for a while? We knew what they were looking for. Yeah, that way past the third hill. There's another campsite just like this one. It ran in and out of the trees, there. Mika said, sounding almost irritated. The soldiers seemed taken aback when Mika so confidently delivered the answer he wanted. I think he knew that we knew. The soldier sighed again. I need you all to get out of here now, he commanded sternly but relentingly. And if you don't want trouble, stay away. My desire for answers was quickly outweighed by my need to get away from this thing in the woods, and looking to the others, they nodded in agreement. We slung on our packs, and the soldiers made their ways out. We then set off, back up the trail. We were going home. The walkout was our final silent checkpoint in the timeline of our bizarre experience. Eventually, the green tunnel developed some holes and soon we stood next to our truck. We loaded our gear and started it up. Piling in, we talked retrospectively about what we'd seen. I think we all didn't, or couldn't, believe that it all happened. 
and talking through it made us feel like we could truly think about it. We'd have to track down the other group when we got back and figure out what they'd seen. We sat for a bit, and eventually we set off for the winding hilly back roads that would lead us back home. As we passed the now leaving sign, written in plain white dremeled letters, a thin column of black smoke arose from the forest from right on the other side of hill number 29. What was that thing? From Andrea Tiger Lily, 03. I was off on a hunting slash camping trip with my boyfriend and my dog Moose, who's a 110 pound Malamute. We had set up camp in an open clearing next to a small stream, and we decided it was a perfect, beautiful night to go for a walk. It was about 2.30 a.m. We had grabbed some flashlights, and I brought Moose along with us. It was a warm night, and the moon was only half visible through the thick black clouds. The trail we had decided to go down was thick with brush and trees pressing in on us from all sides. Feeling a bit creeped out, Ash, my boyfriend, and I tried to lighten the mood by making jokes about the paranormal of all things. Jokes about the weird shadows that the moon was making as it tried to push through the clouds. A few miles in, Moose began to growl and snapped at something that, as far as we could tell, wasn't even there. I found this very strange, as Moose was usually very happy, a very gentle dog. Never in my life had I heard Moose growl so aggressively. We trudged on anyway as we figured as Moose was a city dog, he wasn't used to these woods. Maybe he was just smelling a fox or a coyote. A few more minutes in, we noticed that the once noisy with nightlife forest began to grow eerily quiet and then completely silent, except for the sound of Moose growling and whimpering. Moose had grown more anxious and scared than ever now, so much so that I slipped his collar and leash over him. Although I soon realized there was no need for that, because he had himself pushed up so hard against my leg, I almost fell over. His hackles were raised, and Moose looked larger and scarier than I'd ever seen him. I took this as a sign of us needing to turn back. I reached my hand over Moose and tried to calm him down. In a hushed whisper, I told him, It's okay, buddy. Come on. I got back up to my feet and grabbed Ash by the arm. We were about to turn back when at that same moment, we heard a twig snap in the direction of the ongoing darkness in front of us. Then, we were both hit by the most absolutely disgusting smell I'd ever smelled, like rotting flesh seasoned with sulfur. Moose never ceased growling and started to whimper and pull at the leash in the direction opposite of whatever this was, but we were too scared to move. A few seconds later, I noticed movement in the darkness. I did something stupid. I shined the flashlight into the brush, and I immediately regretted it. In the light, there were two glowing, never-blinking yellow eyes. Eyes about nine feet off the ground. Its head looked to be the head of a decaying deer. Body pale. You could see the ribs through its skin. Its arms were long and lengthy, and its hands had wicked-looking claws about four and a half inches long. We stood there, terrified, as this thing looked back at us. And then this thing, right before us, spoke. It's okay, okay buddy. Come on. on. What? It said what I'd whispered to the dog, in almost my same voice, but in the exact same inflection. What was happening? This was our cue to leave. I broke out of my trance and grabbed Ash by the arm again, yanking us in the direction of his truck. As we ran, I made the mistake of looking back. This thing was no more than ten paces behind us and gaining speed. My adrenaline kicked in and pushed us faster to the truck. We soon made it, 
turned it on and hit the gas. We were just starting to really pick up speed when we heard a crash in the back, as well as serious clawing in the back of the pickup. I looked back and saw Moose in the window, growling at the thing, teeth bared and clawing out the back window to get out. He wanted to attack the thing. I was half tempted to let him, but I didn't want to risk his life. Ash, after a night of not saying much, finally screamed at me to get the gun out from underneath the back seat. I did, and we tore out of those woods faster than when we came in. As we hit the tree line exiting the forest, that thing jumped out of the back of the truck, but we heard a terrifying, blood-curdling scream chilled me right into my veins. It sounded eerily like Ash when he had screamed a few seconds ago. We spent the night in a hotel. Me and Ash barely spoke to each other that night, just gave each other wary, worried looks. Moose was sleeping on my bed, growling at everything that moved. We decided to go get our things back from the campsite, or well, what was left of it. That morning, we found the tent shredded to pieces. Cooler had been dumped over, completely beyond use anymore. We grabbed what we could salvage and threw the rest away. We canceled this hunting trip and went home early. We haven't really told anyone this story. It still creeps me out to think about. When I go to sleep, I have trouble not seeing those eyes and hearing that scream. I don't know if any amount of pills or therapy will help me. I haven't been hunting or camping again, nor do I think I ever will. I'm 26 now and a sophomore in college. Ash and I are still together, but poor old Moose has gone on to the next part of the journey of life. Be careful, everyone. A Ghostly Visit at a School Camp from Anonymous. I was camping with other fourth years of my secondary vocational education. All the fourth years went camping and the students from my class got to sleep outside in tents. On the last night, we all decided to sleep outside the tents to sleep out under the stars. As the night progressed and the teachers went to bed, every one of us began to feel uneasy, as if something bad was going to happen. Right before we decided to go to sleep, I started to feel like I was freezing all over. Though no one else felt like this, I began to fear for my life and I didn't know why. Hours later, around 8am, I saw a group of my classmates huddled together, whispering. I went over to them to ask what was going on and when they turned towards me, I must have spooked them. One of my classmates, Rob, began to explain what he saw the night before. He told us that he had trouble sleeping. He looked around the campsite and saw a soldier walking among the sleeping kids. He appeared to be dressed in much older garb than was normal, and there were scars all over his body. Rob was trying to convince himself that the soldier was there to protect us, to watch over us, but that feeling of imminent death, of terror, of freezing cold, I don't think that would come from a spirit that didn't mean harm. I never did tell the others what I felt. I didn't want them to be more scared than they were. Even as we left the camping grounds, I kept feeling that icy coldness, as if at any moment, whoever or whatever was there would strike. But it never happened. Even to this day, I wonder what could have happened. Warning, the following story contains violence against pets. You can use the timestamps in the description to skip to the next story if you like. I watched it take my dog from country 1989. This terrifying experience happened in Montana, Kiowa to be exact. We're beef farmers up here and dabble a little bit in hogs and hay. The ranch is around a thousand acres and we run an open pasture operation. Basically, our 300 heads of stock roam free, free as a bird. With that being said, you'll have to maintain and check on your herds and keep them safe from mountain lions and brown bears and even wolves or coyotes. 
One day, local officials were alerting everyone of a few local attacks on other farmers' cattle. Me and my brother and a friend went out that very same night to check out the northwest pasture. We had cattle out there. I took the ATV for the supplies and Wade and Bird ran horses. Three hours later, we get to the herd, starting to check for signs of bears or lions. We didn't find a trace of old deer or elk or anything. We set up camp, just in case. These cows were our livelihood. We had a couple of sleeping bags on the ground with a brown tarp posted up on one side, another side pegged down. We were sitting around a fire we made, telling dirty jokes and talking, until we began to hear a wolf's howl. We were prepared for this. We kept a close eye out, continuing to talk, but a little more alert than before. Soon we heard another wolf call. This one was closer and deeper. And if you ask me, it sounded stranger than the normal wolf call. Wade stood up and yelled out some curses, having a good laugh at the animals that we couldn't even see. Then he started to howl back. We laughed, and about half an hour later, we began to hear horses. They were starting to fuss and whine. They were only a few yards away from us, but we didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But then one of the dogs we brought started to growl too. We get quiet. Suddenly, the dog just takes off. It's a young pup, about a year old. We named him Mo. We tried to take off after him, but in that kind of dark outside the campfire, we didn't really know which way he went. So we stood quietly, ready to go once we heard where he was. We realized then that all the animals, cattle and horses and all that, and even the woods next to us, everything's gone quiet. So you can imagine we nearly crapped ourselves when something hits the fire. With a loud thud, a large weight falls to the ground. It was Mo. Something threw Mo back into our camp and his head was gone. Wade starts screaming where the F is his head, as I notice there's four deep gashes on one side of the dog. Then we start smelling this god-awful stench, like B.O. to the extreme. Only then did the horses start going crazy. One busted loose and bolted for the hills. The other one was trying to do the same, until we spot this dark figure attempting to tackle the horse. Its body was cloaked by the darkness, thanks to the lack of moonlight. Even so, his eyes appeared to glow, and every time he looked over at us and blinked, it felt like it was tearing into my soul. Whatever it was began to make its way towards the fire, towards us, only stopping to stand up and continue walking on two legs. It stepped close into the light, and we saw it. It was almost seven and a half feet tall, hairy, with broad shoulders. Its head was wolf-like, but its nails were like steak knives. Its teeth were stained a harsh yellow, and the creature itself was a dirty gray-white color, and it stank to high heaven. We all froze for a second, when all of a sudden, there was a loud bang. My brother starts firing shots off. The creature... Instead of flinching or bolting away, just calmly backs up away from the light. It growls and snarls as it does so. Bert tells us to get to the side by side. We nodded and quickly made our way there. Bert sat in the back and Wade was sitting next to me as I started driving. I bottomed that pedal out as we went. My eyes began to water, tears I guess, when I heard Bert start shooting from the back. I knew we were being chased. It didn't stop until we hit pavement. We finally made it back to the main part of the farm. I saw my dad, who was asking, Where are the horses? Are you guys alright? I was about to spill it when my brother said, Dad, we were attacked by a brown bear. I looked at him with confusion, but agreed with him. Yeah, a brown bear. Dad mumbles, well, thank God you're alive. That part, he couldn't be more right about. No more camping for me. From 
It's Memer, P12. When I was 14, my family and I went on a camping trip for the weekend. We asked my dad if we could go explore when we got there, and by we, I mean my brother and I. When we got the okay, we walked for at least half an hour, but then we stopped, because my brother said, Look there. I looked, and there was a wide opening in the trees. I suggested we take a look, and my brother agreed. We go to the wide opening and instantly hear a loud scream coming from the other side of it. It was like something straight from a nightmare. My brother, in a panic, grabbed me and began to run back to camp. When we made it back, my parents asked if we were okay, but we said we were simply racing. That night, when everyone went to bed, I got up to grab a flashlight and started walking towards the opening. It may have scared my brother, but I wanted to know what was in it. I wanted to know what was making that noise. I got at the opening and turned the flashlight off. I was beginning to hear something like footsteps. Whatever it was was large and fast. The moonlight lit up the area, and I could see something standing in the middle of the opening. It was long and white, humanoid in shape, but way taller than anyone I'd ever known. It held something in its hand. A deer. I wanted to scream then. Just as I was about to, my brother grabbed me and shushed me. But this surprised me anyway, so I released that scream, and the thing looked at us. It then bared its teeth at us in a way that looked like a smile. The two of us took off back to the campsite and woke my mom and dad up, telling them that we had to leave now. My brother grabbed the car keys and said that he would explain later. Somehow he did manage to convince them to leave. We drove out of those woods, but I looked back one more time and saw that thing standing there. It had its hand or claw up in the air, and then it just walked back into the woods, and I never saw it again. I don't know what it was, but camping hasn't been the same since, and I don't know if I'll ever want to do that again. My brother did eventually explain to my parents what happened that night, but they didn't believe him. When my dad and my brother went back to fetch our things that we'd left behind, they found dead deer everywhere, blood and remnants all over the campsite. They got everything they could that wasn't soaked in blood, but even my dad swears that as they were leaving, he thought he heard laughter in the distance. They got in the car and drove home, and camping has since been off our list of activities. Well, I hope you enjoyed this whopper of an episode about scary and allegedly true camping stories. Join us again next time very soon, because I'd love to go over your scary hunting encounters, backwoods experiences, and many other scary stories. If you have a story of your own, you can send it to us at darkstories.org to have it narrated. If you want to support the show, check the links in the description. Until next time, here are the credits to all my lifetime patrons. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.